Okay, I think we'll begin. I want to welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Blair Rubel, and I'm Vice President for Programs here at the Wilson Center. And as many of you know, the Wilson Center is the official presidential memorial to our 28th president. Uh, Woodrow Wilson is the only president to hold a PhD. So when Congress uh, established the center 49 years ago, we were one of two living memorials to American presidents, the other being the Kennedy Center. And the idea behind the center is to um, honor Wilson's legacy as a scholar as well as a political figure by bringing together the world of ideas and world of public affairs. And we've done that in a variety of ways uh, for f five decades now. And one of the ways we do it is by having uh, vibrant regional programs and thematic programs. And there's no program here at the Wilson Center that's more vibrant than the Africa program. Uh, thanks to the wonderful leadership of uh, Monday, Dr. Monday Muyangwa. And uh, it's always a pleasure to um, be associated with, with Monde and her excellent programming, as I'm sure uh, you will see uh, during the next um, course of the afternoon. And I want to welcome you all to um, an event entitled Maximizing Women's Economic Leadership Participation and Impact in Africa. It's an interesting title because it sounds a little bit like it's a construct reflecting the flavor of the month. But underneath it is a very serious idea and the need for a paradigm shift in how we think about the continent, how we think about economic leadership, so that um, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, uh, it won't seem like checking the box. It'll just seem like, yes, you can't talk about economic leadership in, the, in Africa or any place else uh, without integrating uh, our perception of women's economic leadership into that conversation. And this panel is part of that process of, of trying to position the subject in a way that it no longer becomes special. It just becomes a fact of life. And that is a, a difficult process uh, because of some of the intellectual uh, baggage that we all have, have brought uh, into the room. But it's an important process. And I can't think of a better group of people to, um, to move thinking along uh, in this area. Uh, this is an event which is sponsored by the Brown Capital Management Africa Forum Series. Um, and I, I, Monday and I talk about this frequently. Brown Capital, for us, is not just a hugely successful economic entity. It is a an entity that really uh, is very much connected with human beings, uh, with Eddie Brown and his wife, uh, Sylvia, who have been really wonderful partners for the Wilson Center. And it's always, uh, a, always a great uh, opportunity to listen to Eddie, to welcome him uh, to the center, and I'm, I'm going to do that in a moment. I also want to welcome members of his team, uh, Mr. Cal Baker, Ms. Nooper Flynn, and Mr. Rob Young. I'd like to welcome members of the African Diplomatic Corps and members of the Africa Program Advisory Committee. Uh, as, I've, as I just mentioned, the Browns have been uh, especially generous to the Africa Program here, to the Wilson Center as a whole, um, through their work on the Wilson Center's National Cabinet, through their support of the Africa Program, and this is an example of their support, and through their goodwill, generosity, wisdom, and intelligence. And uh, they are a true partner, and, and we at the center very much value our partnership with them. So with that, um, I'm going to uh, begin uh, to turn over the podium uh, as the event will assess the state of women's economic participation in Africa. It's going to highlight both challenges and opportunities facing women as they participate in and impact on African economies. And to get us started, I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Brown to come up and speak, and then he will uh, introduce uh, Dr. Muyangwe, and, and the conversation will be off and running. 
So thank you. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, how many of you have been before to one or more of the Africa programs here at the Wilson Center? Okay, so we have a lot of new folks. That's good. In fact, that's great. Thank you, Dr. Rubel. Dr. Moyangwa. I got it. I practiced this for three years now. <laughs> finally got it. Our distinguished speakers and guests, and to all of you, uh, the audience, for being here today. I'm Eddie Brown, and it is Eddie. It's not Edward. It's not Edwin. I had to practice that in school throughout. I'm the founder, CEO, chairman. I reverse those orders, depending on the situation, of Brown Capital Management. At Brown Capital, we greatly appreciate your continued support and interest in the Africa Program events hosted by our partners, the Wilson Africa Program. Through this forum and series of events, we strive to expand the discussion of critical Africa issues, bringing both challenges and opportunities to the forefront of policy discussions. Today, we hope to continue this effort, focusing on one of the most critical sectors of economic growth in Africa, women's participation, and how we can increase women's impact and drive economic growth. Again, thank you to the Africa Program, the Wilson Center, to our distinguished speakers and guests, to the audience for your support of the Brown Capital Management Africa Forum at the Wilson Center for joining this event today. I will now turn it over to Dr. Monday. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Um, thank you, Dr. Rubel and Mr. Brown, for your warm words of welcome and for doing such a great job of setting uh, the stage for our discussion this afternoon. I want to thank our speakers for joining us. I think we have a fantastic uh, panel here uh, this afternoon. But I want to add my voice also to Dr. Blair's voice on thanking Brown Capital Management for sponsoring uh, this project, this series of discussions under this forum because as many of you know, Africa really doesn't rate highly in Washington, and to have somebody who understands the importance of showcasing Africa and focusing the spotlight on Africa, and perhaps getting more people to be interested uh, in Africa at both the individual, but more importantly at the policy level is just absolutely uh, great, and I cannot thank Brown Capital enough uh, for giving us this opportunity to do just that. So thank you to Brown Capital Management. Before we begin, I also want to welcome those of you uh, joining us on Twitter. You can, you can follow the live tweets of today's events by following the Africa Program's Twitter account, at Africa Up Close, and you can contribute to the discussion using the hashtag at Women's Empowerment, all one word. Let me take a few minutes just to quickly provide a backdrop to our discussions today. This event is not meant as a knock on African countries. There are areas where Africa is ahead of the rest of the world when it comes to women's inclusion. For example, in the political space, Africa has now had four female presidents, numerous prime ministers, and vice presidents. In 2015, 12 African countries had more than 30% women in their lower and single houses of parliament. Five countries had more than 40% female representation in parliament. And one country, Rwanda, had elected more than 60% women in Parliament. By August 2017, which is uh, just last month, six of the top 20 countries accounting for the most female parliamentarians were in Africa, with Rwanda leading the world at 6.14%. So this is not a knock to say Africa isn't doing some good stuff. It's just a way of saying some progress has been made 
but much, much more work deserves and needs to be done. Given current statistics, it is clear that we especially need to do more to empower women in the economic sphere. Women comprise approximately 51% of Africa's population. They play a vital role in Africa's economic life. But the African Development Bank's 2015 report, and I quote, women are more active as economic agents in Africa than anywhere else in the world. They perform the majority of agricultural work, own one third of businesses, and in some countries make up 70% of the, work of the workforce across the formal and informal sectors. Beyond this, African women play the pivotal role in economic well-being of their families. In fact, in Africa as elsewhere in the world, women often face greater constraints in balancing family and wage earning work. So given all of these issues, it's critical to look at how best African countries can continue to facilitate and empower women's participation in the economic sphere. The African Union and its member states recognize the importance of women's empowerment. In 2013, the African Union adopted the Protocol on the Rights of Women in Africa. They adopted the African Gender Policy in 2009 and declared 2010 to 2020 as the African Women's uh, Decade and established the first African gender scorecard in 2015 as a way of assessing how well African countries are living up to the commitments to empower women across a variety of spheres. But in that same 2015 report, the African Union noted that despite the remarkable growth of African economies in the preceding decade, with six of the top 10 fastest growing countries in the world being in Africa, and I quote here, the rosy picture masks great greatly gender inequalities and exclusion in the core sectors driving economic growth in Africa, end quote. In short, women were largely being denied opportunities to benefit from and contribute to Africa's economic growth to their fullest potential. Among other disturbing trends, this has led to what is seen as the feminization of poverty in African countries, where the face of poverty is largely female. Hence the importance of today's discussion. How can we maximize econ women's economic leadership, participation, and impact in Africa? What are the challenges that hinder women's economic participation across the continent? Why is the vast majority of women clustered in the informal sector where they mostly earn irregular and unstable incomes, preventing them from increasing their participation in and contribution to economies across the continent? What are some of the policies and practices that have worked that could be adopted to Af by African countries and how can international partners best support African women's empowerment? So we'll delve deeper into all of these questions and we have a fantastic panel here to help us uh, dig into these uh, questions. Our speakers this afternoon come from very different but mutually reinforcing perspectives from a business practitioner's and policy driver's perspective. One provides an international nonprofit organization perspective we have U.S. government and international foreign policy perspectives from USID and the Department of State. And we have a perspective from an, an international nonprofit slash consultancy perspective working with uh, businesses in Africa. So let me now introduce our speakers and I'll do so in the order in which they will speak. We have given them five minutes each, sorry, seven minutes, uh, seven minutes each to offer their opening remarks, and after all of them have spoken, we will then open it up to uh, Q&A. Uh, you have their bios in the materials that we provided, so I'm just going to give a short introduction of each person, and then we'll go from there. Our first speaker will be Ms. Wida Chachester, who is a manager at Business for Social Responsibility, Social Responsibility, or BSR, a global nonprofit organization that works with more than 250 companies to build a just and sustainable world. Her work focuses on human rights, sustainable communities, and women's empowerment. And she's here largely because in March of this year, uh, BSR released a series of reports on women's economic empowerment in sub-Saharan Africa, including studies in the apparel and mobile technology industries. So we've asked her to assess uh, the current status of women's economic participation in Africa to share some of the key findings and recommendations uh, from that work that she has been doing for many years on the African continent and to uh, offer some recommendations about how we might enhance women's economic participation in Africa. So, Widya, you're on first. Your f seven minutes start now. <laughs> So 
you've got the slide. Yeah. Yeah. Anna, you got it? Well, thank you so much for having me here today. It is a real honor and pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm going to focus my presentation on the research that BSR colleagues and I conducted and published earlier this year with support from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Our research looked at the specific barriers um, holding women back in sub-Saharan Africa and the area in which companies um, are likely to have the greatest impact on advancing women's economic empowerment. Um, as part of this research, we published four reports. Uh, the main ref report um, focused um, on sort of any company um, operating in the region. And the other three reports focused on the mining sector, um, on apparel manufacturing, and on telecoms. Um, while we focused our uh, research on the whole region, uh, we did our specific um, field research in Kenya, Tanzania, and Ghana. Um, so that's where a lot of our case studies came from. Um, but to kick us off, um, so we're all working uh, with a common definition of what we mean by women's economic empowerment. Um, at BSR, um, in our work, uh, we use a definition from the International Center for Research on Women that states that a woman, is, a woman is economically empowered when she has both the ability to succeed and advance economically and the power to make and act on economic decisions. Okay, so why does women's economic empowerment in Africa matter? We know that women in Africa are economically active through agriculture and trade pursuits, but tend to be constrained in the formal labor force. For example, they tend to earn about 70 cents per, for every dollar that, the, that, um, that men earn. They face greater educational barriers and carry heavier social burdens than their male counterparts. For example, when women tend to spend about two times as much on domestic work compared to men. This, along with a number of other factors, results in $95 billion of lost economic activity in Africa due to gender inequality each year. So while it's clear that women contribute a significant amount in economic activity, they aren't given the same rights and benefits as men, and therefore, much of their potential is lost. Economic empowerment is crucial to creating a more inclusive, and productive economy that everyone will benefit from. So at BSR, um, we know that efforts to advance women's economic empowerment need to address the key underlying economic, social, cultural, and political factors that serve as barriers to gender equality and women's empowerment to be effective. So we identified 12 key factors or building blocks um, that are necessary for women's economic empowerment. Um, however, in the interest of time today, I'm going to focus on three of these issues that are specifically um, critical to, to business. Um, I'll look at safe and equitable employment opportunities, social protection and childcare, and education and training. So women in sub-Saharan Africa are more likely than men to be unemployed, self-employed, or to work in the informal employment sector. Um, this can have far-reaching and destabilizing effects on their health and the well-being of them and their families. Uh, women workers are less likely to have access to health care, to pensions, or to earn regular wages. Um, so there are many reasons uh, why women have difficulty accessing safe and equitable employment opportunities. Um, in many parts of Africa, women's lower education, um, expectations around their household responsibilities, and weak or unenforced uh, employment laws all play a role in this. For, in access, so access to affordable and high quality childcare and important social benefits, such as maternity leave, um, health insurance, and social protection, are also crucial to women's economic empowerment. Uh, for women who are formally employed, insufficient maternity leave can put them at risk of losing their jobs, and it can affect their health and the health of their newborns. Uh, while all three of the focus countries that we looked at um, have protection, legal protections in place uh, for, um, for, for women um, in this area, all, the women that we interviewed 
um, still struggle with the lack of workplace flexibility and accommodations for mothers um, that are nursing, and all of this limits their ability to succeed economically. From looking at existing research, uh, we know that education is essential to women's economic empowerment. Uh, it can reduce intergenerational poverty because educated girls marry later, they have fewer children, who in turn tend to be healthier and better educated themselves. Unfortunately, to this day, women represent the majority of illiterate adults in Africa with a significant gender gap in secondary um, and higher education. This impacts women's ability to capture economic opportunities. So what can companies do? And why should companies care? Because ensuring that women can achieve their full potential at work and in other aspects of life is not only good for women and communities, it's good for business. For businesses, empowering women can represent an incredible opportunity to improve financial performance and long-term business resilience. It also happens to be the right thing to do. So we developed recommendations for business operating in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and we used a framework that includes three elements, act, enable, and influence. So we identified areas where businesses can act directly, where they can enable others, and where they can use their influence to protect women's rights and bolster economic empowerment across the region. And again, I'll go uh, into just three of these quickly. Creating gender-sensitive workplaces is about transforming corporate culture uh, to value the contributions of men and women equally and to attract more women by supporting open and constructive worker-manager relations that ensure that women have access to quality childcare and create family-friendly workplaces. Uh, it's also critical that women and their families have access to affordable health care. Um, however, it isn't enough to make these changes in one business uh, which is why we, we recommend businesses participate in industry and business initiatives that promote women's economic empowerment uh, in the region. So we know that women are typically found in the lowest level positions and face structural and cultural barriers to advancement. And so this lack of women in leadership can have ripple effects throughout the whole talent pipeline. Therefore, it's important to ensure that promotion and recruitment processes are fair and encourage leadership opportunities for women. It's also important to tackle underlying unconscious bias and provide women with supportive mentors, both men and women. So while women make up a large portion of small business owners, uh, many struggle to grow due to lack of credit or long-term contracts with buyers. So companies can work with NGOs, um, local capacity building organizations, and financial institutions to strengthen women's entrepreneurship skills and their stability as suppliers for larger companies through preferential contracts and access to finance. So in closing, um, I want to acknowledge that accelerating progress on women's economic empowerment will not be easy. The challenges are extremely complex and tackling them will require significant commitment and investment by all sectors of society. That said, unlocking the full potential of women could have a truly transformative effect on families, communities, and entire economies in Africa. This transformation would benefit business by driving productivity, innovation, and profitability. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wida. Our next speaker is going to be Dr. Shay Garrison, who specializes in women's empowerment and gender-sensitive program and policy design in her role as program manager in economic empowerment and entrepreneurship for Vital Voices Global Partnership. There, she oversees an ExxonMobil-sponsored accelerator program for women, small and medium-sized uh, enterprises in Africa. Uh, the Middle East and Latin America. So we asked her to speak from that uh, SME perspective, addressing more or less the same 
issues and questions that we raised. So share, the mic is yours. I do, I'm ready. <laughs> Good afternoon. I have a um, similar perspective, but come at it from a different angle, so I think you'll learn something different. I am both an academic researcher and a practitioner, so I'm going to share with you um, the research that proves why I practice what I do. So why do we need to focus our time and our money and our resources on the economic empowerment of women? Well, when I think about it, I like to think beyond uh, feminism, beyond gender equality even, and say that simply it just makes good sense. Uh, there is um, much, much research out there that proves that empowering women to participate in all different spheres of society leads to better social and um, economic development, not just for women, but for their families, their communities, and their nations. I'd be glad to share some of that research with you if you'd like to email me. Particularly in Africa, though, um, one of the, the most simple ways of looking at it is that when a, women, a woman holds more income in her hands, she has more bargaining power within her household. Um, there is research to show as well that this has a positive correlation on where the resources of households go. They go generally more often to improve the situation of families. Child education status ra is raised, child nutritional status is raised. There's even a connection between uh, decreased child mortality and female uh, household bargaining power. Particularly in Africa as well, there are many developmental challenges that can be addressed by increased female economic empowerment. However, we don't have time for a lot of those today. I want to focus on one that's very important. Africa deals most of its countries with a high unemployment rate. And as the youth population grows in Africa, uh, this becomes either more of a challenge that we must address or more of an opportunity. This youth population could be driving economic growth in Africa and is in some areas. So what I wanted to mainly focus on with that in mind is small and medium-sized enterprises um, for women because there is globally about 45% um, of employment is created by these small and medium-sized enterprises. And in Africa, in 2011, um, it was about the same. It was al almost 50% of jobs were created. Uh, net job growth actually was 70% created by SMEs and about 45% of employment. So I'm going to share with you in just a moment my practical experience with that as well. But just looking broadly at women's participation in the economy in Africa, women really do participate. Um, in my experience as well, there's a huge entrepreneurial spirit there, especially with women. So when you're looking at female economic empowerment, you can't think of just about, just about labor force participation rates or the number of jobs. You have to think about the quality of jobs as well. And as was already mentioned, about 66 to 74 percent of women in Africa are in the informal uh, labor market. And what I would like to add to that is, um, although that can be a great thing in some areas, women are more vulnerable to exploitation. And some of the work I've done is in human trafficking. And um, they become vulnerable to labor trafficking, abuse, um, and as well as they are not covered by labor law. So another um, problem, as I have seen it in my practice, is that women do face higher barriers to um, owning their own businesses. They this mainly comes in the form of gender inequality in legal processes mainly in enforcing contracts or in property rights. So I, I do want to say, though, a lot of uh, advancement has been made over the past few years in decreasing this inequality between men and women in this area, but there's still wor more work to be done, as Dr. Monde said. So I want to focus, because this is, this is what I, I do as program manager of the VV Grove Fellowship, um, for Vital Voices. 
We have a year-long fellowship where we take women business leaders from around the world, and over the past four years, over a third of our fellows have been from Africa. We supply them with business skills training and leadership training, and this is another critical point. We help provide them with access to business connections, to networks. It's not something that you think about often, but all over the world, women have less access to networking, to just connections, than uh, men do. And this can lead to a decrease in their productivity. So those are two important areas as we also continue to work on uh, decreasing gender inequality in, in uh, uh, women-led businesses or actually doing business in Africa for women. So very briefly, uh, I just wanted to tell you about the practical proof that backs up what I'm talking to you about. Um, I mentioned our fellowship program with you, uh, to you. We begin tracking fellow data and monitor monitoring and evaluation data from when they begin the fellowship to years after they have completed. For our first cohort, which was in 2013, a year after they completed our fellowship, um, let's see, on average, 24% of fellows reported an increase in annual, excuse me, fellows, all fellows on average, reported a 24% increase in annual sales, 46% of them reported full and part-time employees with a net gain of six employees. The next year were similar results with a 26% increase in sales and a net gain of nine employees. Mm -hmm. So we have seen this in our own practice that SMEs drive business growth. Um, also, all cohorts have reported that at least one of the business connections that we help provide them with led to some type of business growth. I'd like to leave you with this. Um, this is from Joy, who is from Kenya, one of our fellows. She doesn't care about the statistics that I just told you about. Um, what she cares about is her family and her community. She says, my experience with the VV Grow program helped me build leadership skills, which I now use to help other women, especially in my community. The women poultry farmers have been motivated and, and encouraged because I have helped them find markets for their products. The young people in the community have gotten jobs on the farms as drivers, farmhands, gardeners, and sales assistants. These jobs are improving their standards of living and educating their children. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shay. Uh, let me now turn it over to our third speaker, who will be Ms. Rahama Wright, who is the founder and CEO of Shea Lean International, a social enterprise dedicated to empowering women in West Africa and the U.S. through production, sale, and use of Shea butter products. Um, Rahama has also served as a member of President Obama's ad Advisory Council on Doing Business in Africa. So she straddles two very important dimensions of, uh, our, of our discussion today, the policy uh, dimension and uh, the importance of ownership of this agenda at the very highest political levels. And as a practitioner, uh, as a business owner who connects Africa and the United States through her, uh, her current business. So, Rama, over to you, my friend. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. As Monday said, I'm the founder of Shea Lean, and my colleague, Lisa, is going to do one very important thing, which is butter you all up. She's got some Shea products <laughs> for you to try. And I think um, the speakers before me made some really excellent points, and Shea, I couldn't agree more in terms of access to networks, and I would add um, access to market is very important. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about you know, this question of why are women trapped, are women in Africa trapped in the informal economy, my question would be, how do you shop? What types of products do you buy? How does that connect to communities of origin? And that is how I started my company. I started Shailene because of that question. How was I shopping? How was I using a product that very much connected to the livelihoods of women in sub-Saharan Africa. So everyone knows what shea butter is, right? Mm -hmm. Right, okay. <laughs> and um, so fr from my perspective, I'm actually gonna 
focus more on the practical business side and kind of the supply chain side because I think it's very important for us to take a step back sometimes from the policy analysis and actually think very tangibly and also look at how we also contribute to some of the challenges that we're seeing. Um, and when it comes to shea butter, this product that is a product that women in Africa have been making for generations, over 90% of it that comes to the global marketplace is not being processed in Africa. Mm -hmm. It's being processed in large seed oil manufacturers in Europe and Asia. And so uh, a local product, the raw material, is shipped out in large quantities. I'm using shea butter as an example, but if you look at any commodity, if you look at any product that's coming from Africa, it's exactly the same supply chain. You know, whether it's an ag product, a mining product, I think someone, you were talking about mining. Um, how can we create value-added products that then connect to the marketplace? And if we can't answer that question, these communities will continue to be trapped in the informal economy. And that's just the reality of it. And so what my company does is we help women take a local product, add value, instead of selling off the raw material, which is a seed, we actually give them access to everything that they need so that they can take that local product, process it into something a consumer can use, and then we take it one step further and connect it to the consumer. So our products are sold in Whole Foods. We currently have a contract with MGM Resorts. And by doing that, we're creating jobs. But to your point, I, I can't remember who made the point, it's not just job creation. It's the quality of the job. And my definition and the definition I use for economic empowerment of women in Africa is living wages. Are these women making living wages? One of the questions I hear all the time when I talk about this issue is, well, if a woman is making money, isn't her husband taking it and using it? And I think that that's a misconception. Yes, it's a reality in some places, but the women in the communities that we work in, and we work with women in northern Ghana, um, by having access to income, they actually have more voice within their family. And the number one thing the women in our cooperatives do is send their kids to school. And it doesn't matter if it's a boy child or a girl child. That's the number one thing that they're doing mm -hmm. is they're, you know, when, when I interview the women who are part of our cooperatives, their focus is how can I create a better future for my kids? And I think that's universal. I think parents anywhere have that same question, especially women. And so when it comes to, you know, this question of why are all these uh, communities struggling with such extreme levels of poverty? I really think we need to ask ourselves, how are local resources being used, one? How are local resources being brought to market? And is there a way to change it so that the local communities can actually benefit from global supply chains in a way that's creating direct financial impact in communities of origin? And some of the challenges, and um, Mande, you talked about being part of the Advisory Council, um, which I think was a fantastic opportunity. It was created under President Obama. It continues under the current administration. And I continue to serve as an Advisory Council member. Um, it was the very first time that the US government actually looked at policy towards the continent of Africa from the perspective of trade versus just aid. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was very smart. And, you know, I was the youngest member, startup entrepreneur. So, you know, and I'm sitting on a advisory councils with, you know, the head of GE Africa and Bloomberg and McKinsey and all of these huge names. And here I am like, how did I get on this council? <laughs> but I think that it was really um, important because what I brought to the conversation was this issue of how to create inclusive business, how to create opportunities so that you know, we're not only looking at the large companies, but we're also looking at the micro level, which is what Shailene does. We work at the very start of the supply chain with this, within this particular um, product, and how do we help women take that product and bring it all the way through the sp supply and value chain and bring it to market? Um, and so being able to represent those issues on an advisory council that was directly advising the president through the Secretary of Commerce was an opportunity for me to really look at this issue of how to engage on women's 
economic development. And some of the things that we discussed at that level was the lack of data. Oftentimes when we're looking at women's issues on the continent, there just isn't enough data. Um, particularly when we're talking about business, when we're talking about economic development, where is the information? How can we get better data? How can we get recent data and accurate data? The other thing which I've touched upon is the importance of providing value-added products or providing the ecosystem so people and women can create value-added products versus selling um, raw material. And then lastly, um, which someone touched upon earlier, is capacity building and training. Um, when we're looking at market development for women's uh, products or um, women in Africa trying to get their products to market, a lot of times it's lack of knowledge on packaging. It could be that simple. Not even understanding, you know, here we are, we're working with women in rural communities, getting them on shelf at Whole Foods or on shelf at a spa in MGM. There are a lot of steps that go into that. And so really figuring out how you can create programs where women can understand if we're going to get out of the informal market, we have to really understand what it is to be part of the formal market. So I know my time is up, but I'm happy to answer more questions, and I hope you guys are getting lots of shea on your hands over there. <laughs> Thanks, Rahama. Um, so this discussion would be incomplete without a U.S. government perspective, or at least a couple of U.S. government perspectives, <laughs> right? Uh, because part of what we want to have a discussion about is how international partners can work with African countries uh, to support efforts to empower um, African women in the economic sphere. So we have two speakers representing two agencies within the, US, within the U.S. government, and they will talk to us about why the U.S. government should care about economic empowerment of women uh, as part of its overall uh, engagement strategy with Africa, but also help us to understand current activities and perhaps help chart uh, provide some recommendations on how we can more effectively engage in that sphere at that governmental uh, level. So our fourth speaker and the first of the two U.S. government perspectives will be Ms. Christina Hardaway, who is a Gender and Entrepreneurship Officer in the Bureau of African Affairs. In this capacity, she leads the Africa Bureau's efforts to promote gender e equality. So I'll turn it over to you for your seven minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pressure. Um, so why does the U.S. government care about women's economic empowerment? Um, it's pretty simple to us. We have found that when women do better, countries do better. So in terms of all of our foreign policy and development challenges, um, countries that respect the rights of women are more prosperous, more stable, and more secure. And as others have, have said time and time again, women are far more likely to invest in education, in health, um, and all other social issues. So we see gender inequality as a major development in foreign policy challenge. Particularly in the case of Africa, um, women, women are involved in the economy. Um, they do a lot of work. Um, and to echo the other statistics, um, gender e inequality is, is costing Sub-Saharan Africa $95 billion a year. So particularly for the Bureau of African Affairs, um, we see integrating women and increasing not only their participation, but the value of women's work, um, a major uh, part of our, our foreign policy priorities. So at the Department of State, we do have a strategy for, for women's economic empowerment. Um, our main objectives are to promote equal access to resources and services, to promote equal access to, to decent work. So once again, women are, are overrepresented in the informal economy um, and, and, do, and owning businesses, but um, we want to recognize the value um, that women have in the formal economy, too, and, and create some productivity there, particularly in the agricultural sector. Um, we promote women's entrepreneurship. So in the Bureau of African Affairs, we have a program called the African Women's Entrepreneurship Program, where we bring about 30 women every year to the United States um, for three weeks. They visit several cities. Um, they come mostly from the agribusiness sector, textile sector, and what we call the artisan sector. Um, to learn about how we do business over here, and, and they also connect with women like Rahama. Uh, she often speaks with our programs. Uh, to learn about women's um, business and entrepreneurship here in the United States. And then we seek to address over our overarching issues that impedes women economic participation. So things like gender-based violence, 
um, discriminatory laws and regulation, access to knowledge and technology, access to healthcare, all these things um, affect women's um, productive economic participation. So the three, well, I, I said more than three, so I hope that's, that doesn't go over seven minutes, but the biggest barriers um, that I have seen in terms of uh, women's economic participation in Africa are one, cultural norm. So there are certain ideas about what women should do and what role they should play in society. And then that in turn spreads to um, other places um, uh, in terms of legal and regulatory and policy barriers. So um, the World Bank does a really good report on women, business, and law. Mm -hmm. And they break down um, by country what type of, of regulations um, that promote gender equality. So mm -hmm. there are a number of countries in Africa, for example, where there's a difference in how men and women apply for ID cards mm -hmm. or how they can sign contracts. Or if you're married, um, men usually have mo the control over marital assets. So if you wanted to apply for a credit line, um, a lot of times women don't have access in their names mm -hmm. um, or inheritance law. So all those things um, in turn um, impact how women have access or agency over their, their economic participation. Um, once again, the types of employment women have, have access to, um, women are usually in the informal economy or low-skilled jobs. In agriculture, where women um, produce most of the agricultural uh, products in Africa, they usually operate smaller plots of land, um, and they have limited access to agricultural subsidies than men. They also have less access to, to infrastructure and technology, like mobile phones, um, where they can chart the, the market prices. And then as others have reiterated, um, I think a lack of access to markets and networks and capital um, is, is also impeding women's productive um, participation in the economy. So in entrepreneurship in particular, African women are an emerging market force. Um, in fact, in, in Nigeria and Zambia, women are more likely to, than men to start their own businesses. Um, but still, women often lack access to, to markets, particularly in the, in, the, in the U.S. example, the U.S. market, um, which is an extremely competitive market, even for large companies, um, they often lack knowledge of what the U.S. market looks like, what, what the demand is, um, networks that they need to, to, to get connected to, to buyers here, um, and then skills and capacity building um, to get their products ready to come to the market. Trade as well, women feature significantly in trade in Africa, and, and in, in fact, um, in um, the African Growth and Opportunity Act, which is our, our trade policy for Africa, um, we seek to feature women prominently in that. Um, they carry goods across borders, they produce products, especially food, um, and they own and manage trade-oriented firms, but they still face specific constraints um, that undermine their economic activity. So um, if they're working in the informal sector, they're often subject to harassment and extortion um, they're more readily denied access to key trader networks than men. Um, Time-consuming uh, trade procedures and documentary requirements also have a bigger burden um, on women who also, okay, who also um, have to take care of the household and are expected to take care of the household. So my uh, recommendations on how we can more effectively enhance women's economic participation um, would be to one, identify um, country-specific priorities, uh, areas for legal and, and policy reforms. Two, don't make gender equality a siloed issue. So a lot of uh, African countries have gender ministries, which is a good thing, but the gender ministry needs to be talking to the trade minister and the chamber of commerce and the economic ministry. So it shouldn't be a separate issue that's over here. Um, two, I think in terms of US companies who, who want to, um, do better in this area, I think they should adjust their business models to recognize that women are, even though they work, they are still expected to, to take care of um, mo most household duties. Um, so for example, they may not be able to work eight hours a day. May, they may can only work six hours a day, or they may have um, restraints on child care, or things like that. And then lastly, I think that we have to make a business case as policymakers for why um, women's economic participation creates opportunities for U.S. companies as well. So. 
Thank you very much for that. I'm reminded of I was working on some gender programs in a different uh, sector. So the point that you made just now about not having the gender portfolio siloed is absolutely critical. I kept calling this one country for three weeks and eventually somebody picked up the phone and said to me, the gender office is not here. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean the gender office <laughs> is not here? It is one person who was responsible for the entire gender portfolio across the government who was on leave, probably you know, needed the leave too. Right. So, sometimes, <laughs> um, so sometimes countries have a tendency to do window dressing on the gender issue. But we can talk about that later. But so <laughs> thank you for, for raising that. So on to our final, but certainly not the least of our, our, our speakers today. I was just saying to him earlier on that for me, women's empowerment in Africa will not succeed without male champions. So I was absolutely delighted to have a male on this panel. You're it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you, Mr. Wei Chanel is a senior economic growth advisor for the Office of Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment at the U.S. Agency for International Development. In this capacity, he leads USAID's efforts to develop a framework for promoting women's economic empowerment and equality and also promotes approaches to women's financial uh, inclusion. He has worked in over 20 con uh, African countries, brings a lot of experience in that area. So over to you with your um, seven minutes, especially looking <laughs> at that framework that you're working on right now. Good, thank you. Um, first, I always have to start with this. I am an employee of the US government, and my opinions are mine only and not necessarily <laughs> those of the U.S. government or U.S. agency for international development, and as much as I hate to say this, my own mother. <laughs> um, and I'm also particularly happy to have Christina here today because when you have your policy questions about the administration afterwards, she'll answer. <laughs> and I, that's really great. Uh, let me talk a, a minute about what we're up to at USAID. We've always had gender as part of who we are, part of what we do. Um, we've gotten more focused and gotten more practical in what we're doing in women's economic empowerment and equality. And note that I'm not interested in helping women move from fourth class citizens to third class citizens. It's either equal or we have a problem. So it's empowerment and equality that's, that's on our agenda. Is to increasingly integrate even more effectively our ability to address these issues across all program areas. Because women's economic equality and empowerment does not just come from focusing on economic factors. We have to look at political and financial and uh, social, educational, health related. So we want to ensure that we begin to look at the economic empowerment aspects in those other areas as well as taking the systemic approach to all of our work. If I'm just focusing on economic, am I going to achieve it? Probably not. How can we expand? We've developed a framework for promoting women's economic empowerment and equality, WE3 framework. You know, we do acronyms, and I like WE3. Um, and in that, what we've done is, is really created a tool for helping people who design and monitor programs to think through what this looks like. Because as much as I love some of the great programs we've seen on gender issues, what I'd like is to enter an age where we no longer need programs on gender issues because it's so well incorporated into who we are and what we do. And this means that we have to think differently, and a lot of that is looking at agency, access, leadership, risk, enabling environment, how women's uh, lives are affected differently than men's lives, and how we can even that. Um, we also have some very practical principles for, uh, for the approach. How do you, um, as, you're, as you're beginning to consider it, we talk about women's empowerment. Well, which women? In what sector? Because what may be very helpful for older women in the rural environment may not help younger women in the urban environment. So being specific, understanding the, the larger system, understanding um, that we may need to be changing or at least expanding who we're working with. Now, often we end up with project, uh, project streams that will work with very good associations, a chamber of commerce, et cetera. For years and years, are there women's associations that are growing? Are they getting, there was a discussion of you know, leadership and role models. If we're not modeling that and bringing them in, then there's a modeling element that's missing for the future as well. Um, the framework is almost done, and I so look forward to giving you a link to that. It's not fully cleared yet, still in draft, and out there are hundreds of copies, so if, if you find one, feel free to read it and enjoy. Um, 
But just going back to the larger questions, this gets us um, into my recommendations. Um, first, uh, I want to note one of the big issues, we're talking about economic empowerment, finance, that's come up across the board here. And by the way, I agree with what's been said earlier. I feel like every time someone's spoken, I've thought we need to do more work together because the, the, these are the right things. But the finance side, we've seen tremendous progress through mobile banking and mobile money in enabling women to, to access the formal financial system, not just hide things in a mattress or bury it in a can in the garden, but actually have a greater safety and risk. What that does not do is address the issue of commercial lending. And it will not. It's not designed for that. There's another issue there, and that's a dysfunctional financial, or, well, dysfunctional in some places, incomplete. And this has been a global uh, change, but incomplete financial systems that are based primarily on mortgages and real property. Well, that's not going to help women anytime soon. It needs to be worked on. But other things, like everything you see in this room, can be used as collateral. Secured lending is changing the face of lending for women. And across the world, but I will give you one example in Ghana, where there's now a secured lending system in place that it uses inventory receivables, future crops, various things that are movable or intangible, a receivable, for example, and not just mortgages. And over the first couple of years, over 6,000 micro entrepreneur, women micro entrepreneurs, were able to access formal commercial finance. It's less expensive because it lowers risk for banks, and that gets passed on in a competitive environment. It's working. So it's, it's quite exciting. I, I'll also note in Colombia, the same thing has, hap um, has happened. Someone just gave me a, some statistics. They recently passed a secured lending law. Women now are receiving 40% of the total value of commercial loans in Colombia. And that is remarkable. We're looking at 10% in most of the world. It's almost par. It's quite remarkable. Um, another is it's not enough to um, hope th to simplify registration. We have to simplify what people are registering for. Something that smaller, micro and small, can handle. If you're registering for a company and you have to have shareholder meetings, annual board meetings, minutes, various things of that sort, you may just not bother. And in most places, people don't bother and they stay informal. The formality is, is changing uh, when it's easier to get something you can use. And this formality, of course, gets you into the banking system and other things. I'm going to use uh, Colombia again just because they've done some remarkable things. I don't have an African example of this. In fact, Colombia is the example. They simplified the corporate form. You can open a company with one person and one share. You don't need a board. You know, as you grow, you can change this. Today, unlike Latin America, where 20% of the companies are owned by women, uh, women in Colombia, it's gone up to 40%. They've had about 800,000 informal companies formalized in the past five years. And 40% of the companies are women owned. So there are some changes we know about that we can do, we can address. Banking, um, some of the commercial law. And then finally, as everyone else has mentioned, uh, if we do not address the issue of violence, we are not addressing the balance of power. Violence is a tool of power, and it's normative. We have problems with it. You know, how to, it, we are taking on social norms, et cetera, but companies can be involved in this through very active uh, or very uh, progressive sexual harassment policies, um, anti-discrimination policies, but also um, services for those who have undergone. We're finding, talking about the business case, there's a business case at the firm level that if your firm is in a high violence country, you're losing three to 5% of your productivity. You've got higher turnover. You've got lower um, on the job productivity among those who have experienced violence. And we know that globally, 35% of women have experienced violence of some sort. I find that appalling. Um, it cannot be ignored. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to get creative. You say, check our website. We do have something on, uh, uh, for all of our programming on how to incorporate work against uh, violent, uh, what is, how do we put it, sorry, um, uh, preventing and responding to gender-based violence. It's, it's just, we can't skip that one. Thank you. Thank you. To all of our speakers for raising some really, really important uh, issues, insightful and very helpful uh, recommendations. I'll open it up to Q&A. We have 25 minutes, so I need everybody to work with me. Uh, just be focused. We want to get as much as we can from the panel that we have here. 
So I'll open it up to um, Q&A. If you want to ask your question, raise your hand. We'll acknowledge you, someone who bring you a mic. You have exactly 30 seconds <laughs> to make your comment. Identify yourself, the organization with which you're affiliated, and which of these speakers you're directing your question or comment to. We'll take three in a row. Okay, so let me do that. Rosemary, I'll come to you. Let me start here. Oh, you, okay, the mic is already over here. All right, we'll, we'll start over here. Now, Rosemary, work with me, right? We have 30 seconds. I see you. <laughs> <laughs> That's my sister, Rosemary, over there. <laughs> <laughs> education. So what do we do? All those years we come here, Miss Monde know me every day, World Bank, IMF, UN everywhere. We're still talking about woman, woman. So what is the next step of the next woman? Thank you. <laughs> All right, I'll take the lady over here and then I'll move it to the gentleman in the back over there. Sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you to the speakers for the great panel. My name is Suke Nesise Job. I'm from Senegal. And I run my own poultry business, which is called Kali Volai. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to ask my question to Miss Christina. As a young entrepreneur concerned with all the socioeconomic challenges that we encounter every day, uh, how do you, in your field of work, deal with the social aspect of the woman's role in sub-Saharan -Sahar African countries? Because we know that the social aspect has also some impact on the economic aspect. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you to all of you. This is really quite good. Uh, my name is Dan Silverstein. I'm a private sector and capital markets advisor with my own firm. I have two thoughts. The first one is, in the United States, uh, women benefited greatly from the Equal Rights Amendment. It codified clearly uh, the idea of equality. Is there talk uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa about something similar where the law actually codifies the equality? And the second thought is for Ms. Hardaway. You talked about bringing African women to the United States. Is there any practical value to creating an all-women's trade mission to bring uh, American women to Sub-Saharan Africa to see uh, Miss Wright's operation in in uh, person. Bring your American women to Africa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, you actually snuck in a couple, but I like them. So. <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> so s three very good uh, comments. Uh, Rosemary's uh, comment about doing a better job of differentiating the types of women so that we can better target policies and programs. What else can we do uh, in that space to get at that differentiation? Um, because one size does not fit all is basically her question. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. Uh, the second question for my sister here from Senegal has to do, and I think it, it loops back into the comment that you made, Wade, about ensuring that you're not just in, uh, addressing the economic aspect, mm -hmm. but as we address these issues, also making sure that we are addressing mm -hmm. the social cultural elements uh, that feed and infect other uh, decision making in this space and the, and the policies, including in the economic space. So what can we do to address that social cultural uh, dimension of what's going on in some African countries, not all African countries, right. but in, in, in some African countries. And then the codification of um, equality. Uh, can you, s one of you say something about uh, the progress that has been made in terms of codifying equality, whether it's through constitutions, because I know some countries have modified their constitution to get directly to that point. Uh, but what else has been done and how can we do this more effectively the flip side of that, though, is there are people who would argue that it's not so much the codification. It's bringing that codification alive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that it's there, it's written in so many documents and policies. But how do you bring it alive? How do you change mindsets? What can we do 
to go beyond the formal written documentation to bring it to life. And then the benefits on all um, women trade mission to the US. So pick one <laughs> and go with it. So Wade, I'll start and then just work down. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna take Rosemary's intervention. I appreciate that um, and thank you for the compliment. Although I think they made a lot of sense too. Yes, they did, but um, <laughs> did. <laughs> Okay, okay, that's family yes. thing, I'll let you go. Um, I think part of it is thinking a little more um, recognizing that each of us brings something and we don't, th having the massive program that, that tries to cover something nonspecific is not helpful. If we start creating more coalitions and alliances and so on to make sure that we know what the picture on the puzzle box looks like and each of us is doing a part of that by actually analyzing which women are we talking about. You know, we have a problem with not getting sex disaggregated statistics. We do bell curves based on averages that may not tell us anything useful. When you think through that logically, you get, you know, uh, four and 12 give you an average of eight. So does seven and nine. What do we now know? Nothing. So we need to get really specific as we do our work. Who are we dealing with? In what way? For what purpose? But I think the big thing is, you know, a lot of us worry that, um, that uh, what we're doing is just a drop in the bucket. And I saw this in somebody's brochure once. It's a drop falling into a bucket. And at the bottom it says, but every drop counts. We need all these drops, mm -hmm. and we need to be more specific in them. Let's focus specifically on what we're doing, and, um, and then if we, as we see gaps that we can't do, let's bring others in as well. So in the first question, I, I agree with Wade that um, we do need to get more specific about the data um, and identify exactly what we're talking about, and then telling the story and successes um, from that. Um, on the questions that were addressed to me, how do we deal with social aspects? So women's economic empowerment is one part of our, our a broad-based gender strategy um, for the U.S. government at the and, and the Department of State. So the other areas that we focus on are women's political participation. So um, we try to encourage uh, countries um, and, and local governments to increase um, the involvement of women in the political sector, and to also give if women training on how they can be involved more politically um, and have a voice. Um, we have a big program on gender-based violence. Um, we also focus on adolescent girls. Um, and then we have a program on women, peace, and security. So overall, the U.S. government has a national action plan on women, peace, and security across three different um, government agencies, including USAID and, and DOD. Um, and in the Bureau of African Affairs, we have our own implementation where we do programming, uh, mostly in, in conflict countries, on increasing women's um, involvement in those. Also, even though these are different priorities, for example, in gender-based violence programs, we will still have a women's economic um, component in that. Um, and even in our adolescent girls programming, we will have um, components of gender-based violence in that. So um, that's how we try to look at it um, on a broad-based um, perspective. And then the practical value of bringing American women to Africa. So that's a good question. So we do do trade missions um, to all to a bunch of different countries. Um, I never thought about doing an all women's trade mission, but when we go, when we do trade missions to um, Sub-Saharan Africa, we try to encourage um, the embassy and our, our commercial officer there to include women um, mm -hmm. in the parties that they're meeting with with our American trade missions. Um, so there might be a practical value of, of bringing an all-women um, trade mission to Africa, but yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any of you have anything to add? Oh, I yeah. wanted to address a different question. Please. Um, I wanted to address your question. What is your name again? Sakina. Mm -hmm. I, you raise a very important um, issue uh, in women's labor force participation, this, the social barriers, the cultural barriers mm -hmm. that we don't really talk about because we don't really have a framework often to talk about that. Um, but I'd like to give an example to uh, show how important that it is that we do uh, at least have awareness and begin to talk about it. I did some formal research in a Gulf Cooperation Council country. And I went to find out what the major barriers were to women's labor force participation. 
So as a development person, of course, I found many structural barriers there um, within the economy. But the number one thing that I heard, and I, I think I interviewed for two plus hours, maybe about 50 women, um, and I think about 20 men, the number one uh, barrier that I heard was a social norm that had to do with a woman's reputation in society mm -hmm. if she took a job role that was not uh, approved of mm -hmm. by society. Now, in this country, it was very different. Um, you know, there were different aspects to what that job role could be. But that's just an example of the different sort of social norms that do drive labor force participation and the quality of jobs that women um, have. So it's a very important aspect that you brought up. And I would just like to also add, uh, Wade was talking about how addressing violence and human rights abuse is such an important aspect mm -hmm. to helping women be empowered economically. And that's very true. And I look at it also from the flip side. I've been working in private sector development and women's economic participation for <laughs> about 20 years now. <coughs> um, <laughs> but I think that um, focusing on economic empowerment for women lifts women up mm -hmm. out of situations. Um, there's actually research to show that out of gender-based violence situations, um, other related yeah. factors to that, um, as well as lifts them out of health issues such as AIDS. There's research to show that as, as well. So anyway, just thinking about it from that point of view as well. Yeah, um, I think there are so many questions. I've, I <laughs> forgot all of them. <laughs> but kind of following up to what you're saying, I think it's kind of like a, the chicken and egg situation. Do we address social norms, these, the social norms issue, by giving women access to living wage jobs? Or do, is that the solution? Or do we have to address the social issues so that women can have access to living wage jobs? And my perspective is that if women have access to living wage jobs, they then have access to more choices, which then leads to addressing these social issues and norms. And if you look at even women's rights issues in this country, it was like that. It wasn't, you know, women woke up one day and all of a sudden had rights. First, the economic, <laughs> first the economic advancement happened and then women were like, hey, okay, I kind of actually like the fact that I'm making money and I ha don't have to go to my husband. And then all of the other things came. And so that's the perspective that I choose to, to follow with that when it comes to Shay Aline, where you know, we're both entrepreneurs. And so I think that what I see from my work is that when women have access to money, they ex ex escape issues of violence within their community. When they have access to money, they make different choices. And so for me, it's give women access to money. <laughs> and then all these other issues that we're addressing. And no, and I don't want to put like, you know, like this broad brush on it. But when they do have access to more money, they have access to more choices. Mm -hmm. And to your point about a trade mission of for women to go, American women to go um, to Africa and, and learn from that perspective, um, kind of a reverse trade mission, I think that's a great idea. Um, with Shay Aline, we've done that. We've had our stakeholders go and work in the communities that we work in and, and see how our model is structured. But we've also had the women in our cooperatives come to the U.S. and go into Whole Foods and you know see the products on the shelf and see how they're a part of the supply chain. And I, you know, I kind of feel like I'm beating a dead horse, but <laughs> we really have to look at the way we shop. We really have to take consumer responsibility. A lot of these issues that we're talking about, at the end of the day, someone is making a vote with their dollar. And so each and every single one of us can change some of these issues by also educating ourselves on where products are coming from that we're using. Because I do think that consumers have a lot of power and um, a lot of the challenges and issues we see when it comes to global supply chains are these supply chains have been set up for decades and for generations. And you know these supply chains are set up in a way that does not benefit communities of origin. And oftentimes, the people who are greatly affected by that are women, to your point about the feminization of poverty in Africa. And so you know that, that's what I would add. I think that it's money first and access to living wages, and then all these other issues will be addressed. 
Great. Well, I'll just add a few brief, <laughs> brief points that a lot of these things have been covered uh, by the panel. Thank you. Um, I think it's critical that women's voices and African women's voices be, be present in this conversation. Um, I mean, what do I know about the African woman experience? I'm a white privileged woman who was born and raised in the United States. And so one of the things that the research that we did tried to do was to really hear those voices and to identify you know, particular women that we wanted to hear from. And so that's why we narrowed the focus of our research to three primary industries. And we looked at three different segments of, of women. So women employed directly in those industries, women who uh, made up sort of the supply chain to, to those industries, so not sort of big global supply chains, but like the immediate supply chain. So who are the women who are providing the food um, to, to those companies, the food service? Who are the women who are providing the cleaning services? And most of those were informal, um, you know, run, women run businesses or businesses um, that women were highly involved in. And then looking at women community members. So how were these businesses impacting the women who were living in the communities? And that was particularly relevant for the mining sector that disproportionately negatively impacts women in the communities where, where it operates. Um, but also, you know, telecommunications. Uh, what sort of impact is that having on, on women as, as sort of this community? And so one of the things that we tried to do was to hear from, from the women themselves about what their challenges are. And, and one of the areas where I think um, I would like to go further is involving the women in, some of this, in more of the solutions. So we developed a series of recommendations for, for businesses in each of those three sectors um, where we did our research. Um, but really putting these into place and making sure that women's voices are involved in that. Because who, who knows better about their experiences and who knows better about what is holding them back than the women themselves? Um, so really that is, a, I think, a, a key goal of any of these solutions is to, is to involve women themselves. Mm -hmm. And finally, one of the things that we found surprising when I went into this research, I thought there was going to be tremendous differences uh, between the mining sector to the apparel sector to you know, telecommunications. I mean, I thought this was going to be, each one was going to come up with a very distinct set of challenges that, that women were facing. And to a certain degree, yes, we found that. But overwhelmingly, what came across was sort of the issues that I presented today, that there is a common experience that, that women are facing. And so there are some common solutions that, that we can put into place. And business absolutely has to be a part of that. All right, I have uh, time to take um, three more questions, but you're gonna have to be super, super concise. <laughs> All right, so let me start from the back over there. Way in the back, there's a lady in the back over there. Good afternoon, my name is Abiola Afolayan. I'm an international lawyer visiting from Rome, Italy. Um, and I'm glad to hear that uh, State Department, DOD, and um, USAID have the 1325 series ongoing. I'm just interested to hear actually from all the panelists because a big part of this whole discussion is the role of engaging male allies. So, so at the end of the day, we can come up with all these strategies, but we also need uh, guys to be on board with that. Mm -hmm. okay. The gentleman right there. I just have a one concise. And who Question. Are you? Oh, my name is Tolela. I'm a, I'm a fellow here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Thank you. I just wonder if there's any work done on South Africa, and 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 what dynamics may have come out of whatever research may have been done there. And the reason I'm asking this is, is many of these issues that have been raised, I've watched them kind of converging, in in, in also interesting and contradictory ways in South Africa. You know, the political and the and the social and the and the and the economic, and and of course the insistence on equality, particularly um, in in the political sector. Uh, you know, we must have a woman president. We must have a woman deputy president, mm -hmm. and 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 so on. But I, I'm just wondering if any work has been done on on women participation in South Africa. Okay. I'll take the lady right here. Hey, so this is a question for everyone. 
But so you've discussed a broad range of different. Uh, who are you? Oh, sorry, Catherine Kaiser, uh, LBJ School of Public Affairs. Thank you. Um, so you've discussed a broad range of different problems and different ways to approach them, and different organizations from government to business to data to academic. How are all of your organizations like working together at this point? Does there sufficient like cross organization uh, participation, or is it an issue to address in the future? Okay, I'll take one more because this is going to be the last time the speakers here. I'll take this lady right here. Hi, uh, my question is for Mr. Wade. Uh, I'm sorry? Chiana. Chiana, okay. I almost said Chanel, sorry. Um, I do. <laughs> so, oh, I'm Sarah Kirkpatrick, and I'm an intern at Vital Voices. Um, so you say that violence cannot be ignored and that 35% of women globally experience violence, but yet how do we create a culturally sensitive atmosphere where women feel like they can actually come forward and um, hold people accountable for their violent actions? Because 35%, I can almost guarantee you, is not the real number. Um, so how do we go about changing social and cultural norms for women to feel more um, protected and feel as though they have a voice to speak out against violence. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. Ms. Rahama needs to leave uh, in a little while, so we'll start with you, and I'm going to ask each of you to just pick one uh, of uh, the questions that uh, have been raised. Uh, the first one on identifying and working with ro male role models and allies. Uh, the second one, on if there's any work that you are familiar with in, on uh, South Africa pertaining to, to these issues. And then the third really has to do with um, the sense that our current uh, approach to women's economic empowerment in Africa is disjointed. So what is happening in terms of working across sectors that you all represent here to make it a more wholesome and comprehensive uh, approach to engaging on, on, on these issues? Mm -hmm. And so the, the final question had to do with uh, sexual and gender-based violence and how you create culturally sensitive norms so that women are protected. I would just comment on that one uh, right away um, and, 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 and say this. This is a tricky issue in many parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be very careful because we should not be creating the culturally sensitive whatever it is and turning it over to Africa, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, somebody made a really, really important point here about African agency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This stuff will not work unless we learn to respect agency of African women. That's where mm -hmm. it starts. And that means them speaking for themselves and them bringing their issues to their table and them tapping into their own societies because there are cultures and practices where this issue of SGBV is attended to. There's a community in my own country of birth, Zambia, where when a woman got married, her body was inspected. <laughs> and if that woman ever came back to our community and she had a mark on her body, let's just say that the other party had some serious explaining to do, okay? So it's how do you tap into some of these cultural uh, norms, positive ones, and really begin to amplify them in other sectors and other areas so that that African agency is respected and is at the forefront. That's not to say international partners can't add value, but I just wanted to step back and say we need to be very careful about who's creating what for whom and who's bringing the amplifying effect and how we respect African agency in all of that. With that, I'll start with yeah. you, Rahama. Okay, really quickly, and I apologize, I do have to leave a little bit early. Um, in terms of the disjointed nature of working on these issues, I think, Part of what I've been doing as an entrepreneur, as someone who's working at a very um, micro level, is participating in things like the advisory council, where I get an opportunity to voice and be a seat at the table in terms of really elevating the role of, of women, women in business, women entrepreneurs throughout um, the policy that's being developed at 
the USG level. And as Christina said, participating in things like the African Women's Entrepreneurship Program and being kind of engaged on a mentor level, being engaged in terms of sharing my experiences, working on supply chain development. And I think that that's what's really important is that people share their stories and share their experiences so that as the government is building and developing these programs, they actually have an ear to what is working and what is not working. And with that, I would like to excuse myself. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ms. Wright. Uh, she, she has another engagement in New York, so she has to go catch her train, but we appreciate you coming here and sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll give you each a minute to answer one of these questions and perhaps offer a final thought. Okay, so starting here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> one minute. I'm a lawyer. I don't do that. Okay. <laughs> but she's got a taser, so I'm aware. Yes, I do. Um, <laughs> let me address the violence issue since you raised it directly to me. Is it a simple issue? No, it is not. These are culturally, uh, culturally woven norms, and I like Dr. Monday's comment there. We have to let African voices be heard. One of the places they're being heard is in South Africa, where there have been some very good programs of engaging men as champions, as spokespeople say, Let's, this is not what a real man does. Celebrities, sports figures, um, singers, so on. Um, is that enough? No, but it's a start. I think the changes we'll see are incremental. And I think, again, we have to be systemic in it. Uh, one, we need men who will stand up and say, this is not right, this is a problem. We need to engage theologically. Husbands, be gentle with your wives. How often do you hear that preached in the thousands of evangelical churches? It is time to point out that this is not a biblical concept and some have adopted it as one. We, we have so many places we can hit the, the different issues, but we do have to, um, we have to engage on a non-guilt basis. We have to gauge on a recognition that we have a world that once violence made more sense, I know that's a little iffy, well, that's a longer conversation, but it doesn't now. Let's change it. It's not about uh, men get up in the morning thinking, how can I put women down today? Uh, very few do that. I'm sure there's some, um, but what world do we want to see and how can we change that? We have to start talking, and that's going to take systemic changes of all sorts, including, and I'll just throw this in, criminal law. If, a, if an accusation of rape or sexual violence turns the woman of a body into a crime scene instead of uh, the dignified treatment of somebody who has been harmed, not many women are going to come forward. We have to change the way we handle accusations. And of course, we have to be fair. Some accusations are false. But nonetheless, right now, for women to come forward and say, I have been abused, I've been assaulted, I've been attacked, opens up a blistering level of assault and abuse and attack, primarily on the internet as well as elsewhere. And I have to say for us men, we have to stand against that first and foremost. Thanks. Thank you. Christina, you're one minute. Okay, I'll take the question on engaging male allies. Um, so I'm also involved in um, diversity and inclusion work at the Department of State. And one argument that we make for um, diversity is that it's not just a good idea, it's actually a good um, reason. There, there's a it makes your organization better when you have a diverse set of ideas and, and diverse perspectives. So in the case of male allies, um, we try to make the case that it makes your economy better, it makes your business better when you include um, women in that. Um, we had, at our last Agoa Forum in Togo, we had a, um, the VP of Whole Foods there, and they said that customers come, they shop at Whole Foods because they feel better about shopping at organizations that have a socially um, responsibility aspect um, to their business and, and that, that man is going up. So we try to make that argument and then on a more practical level, whenever um, we have a, a, a trade meeting or a meeting with the Chamber of Commerce, we try to insert points about why women's economic participation is important and how we can get there. So that's um, how we engage male allies, I guess, on a, a diplomatic level. And I wanted to as answer the question, I forget who asked it, but uh, about partnerships. So partnerships are very important to Vital Voices and particularly in my department where we have done very well in partnerships is 
with uh, international organizations, NGOs within the United States and within Africa, as well as businesses and corporations in the US and within Africa, partnering and finding common ground on pushing women's economic empowerment forward, where we have room, uh, I believe, for improvement, at least in my department, is um, in making partnerships with, with governments, both here and in Africa, one thing that we are working on, though, is uh, I'm part of a women's economic coalition in the city that is trying to bring voice to at least our State Department and USAID. So, but that is a very important aspect of what we do. Thank you. Bring us home, Rita. All right, thank you. Um, I also want to touch on this point of working, working together because I think it's really important. Um, and from the sort of business side of things, the way uh, BSR is approaching this is looking at the different levers of change that a business has um, within its disposal. Mm -hmm. So it has the things that it can do directly. So things that it can act on within its own operations. So that's sort of its initial sphere of influence. It can change policies around um, you know, sexual harassment um, and, and gender-based violence within its own workforce. Um, it, can, it can have you know, policy, policy, it can make sure that you know, women have access to um, health care. It can do only so much within its own operations and that isn't going to sort of solve everything. Um, so it can also work by enabling others. Um, so it can form partnerships with NGOs in the community. It can work by you know, funding other entities that can do things that a business can't do because a business can't do everything. And businesses also have a tremendous amount of influence. So what can, what can the business community either individually or collectively do to influence change in the countries where, where they operate? Um, what can they do as a coalition to advocate for st you know, stronger employment laws that are favorable to women? Um, so thinking about these different ways that a company can get involved um, is incredibly important and brings in this idea that it isn't one actor that's going to change this. These are incredibly difficult problems, and really, to make progress, it's going to need every single part of, of this equation, everyone working together, that drop, you know, drop in the bucket, everyone doing what they can to make a difference. Well, thank you very much. I think a really, really powerful way to end uh, uh, this discussion. Let's, let me just very quickly go through some of what I've heard from our wonderful presentations uh, this afternoon. Uh, I think there's an acknowledgement that women in Africa are economically active, but they are constrained in both um, the formal and informal labor force, but especially in the formal labor, labor force. That some of the uh, issues we need to work on are equitable employment opportunities, uh, child care to sort of minimize uh, the burdens uh, that women have in trying to find a healthy um, family work balance, uh, more education and training uh, for women, absolutely critical but that we also need to remember that the challenges are complex and they will require investments from all sectors of society. And I think this point was made by all of our speakers that we need to have a more comprehensive and coordinated approach, a more cross-sectoral uh, cross uh, partnerships and collaboration and, um, and, and partnerships across uh, these sectors. I think the point was also made that uh, the benefits of women's economic empowerment, whether it's to African countries or to international partners, that it just makes sense. Uh, the benefits go from the household, from the individual, to the household, to the community, to the nation, in terms of economic development, in terms of uh, stability, and in terms of just good um, social uh, well-being of um, of, of our communities and families. So it's an important thing to uh, invest in. Uh, some of the challenges that um, Cher talked about were less access to networks. Uh, we talked about um, the fact that uh, many of uh, the women have less access to finance and also to uh, land. Uh, land and property rights are constrained for many women in, in, in some countries. The, Challenge of social and cultural norms is a big one. I think somebody made a really powerful point here about how if you don't address that space, it has a tendency to bleed into policy. 
Mm -hmm. uh, those biases, those dis the, the discrimination bleeds into policy making. It bleeds into um, the sort of corporate cultures and uh, institutional cultures uh, that we have in different workplaces. So finding a way that allows us to address some of those uh, cultural practices that militate and really in inhibit women from uh, contributing their, their all. Farmer made a really big point, I thought, uh, that has impacted many African countries. And this is the fact that many African countries are still tied to that natural resource production, mm -hmm. that they have failed to add in a significant way that value addition uh, mm -hmm. on the continent itself, which obviously impacts not just the numbers, but also the quality of the employment uh, that women and men, quite frankly, can get because of Africa's inability to really transform its economic production model, where most of the value addition is still happening outside the countries. Mm -hmm. And so how do you fix for that? But there was also another point that Rahama made about being mindful consumers mm -hmm. and sort of walking back that product that you are buying to see how your purchasing power can be used to inform and help elevate the status of women in some of, uh, in some of these uh, countries. We talked, um, let's see, Wade's point about ensuring that we have a systematic approach that addresses the political, the financial, and the social issues. That's a big takeaway, and I think it was reinforced by all of the, the, the speakers here. Uh, and then his very powerful point about ensuring that we address the issue of sexual and gender-based violence uh, as part of the foundational work that we have to do if we're really to have the sort of impact uh, that we are looking for here. So how do you begin to work with Africans to shift some of the cultural norms uh, that may inform uh, such behaviors? And we just last point about really identifying the levers of change in areas where you can take action, areas where you can enable, and areas where you can influence, I thought was uh, particularly uh, powerful. So we have a lot to do here, but I also know that there's a lot of anxiety about what the Trump administration's engagement policy with Africa is going to be. And it was good for me to hear uh, that uh, the programs that state has been uh, undertaking, uh, the work both old and new that Wade is doing uh, with USAID, and the continuation of the president's doing business uh, in Africa Advisory Council, those are all big and important signals. Not sufficient, obviously, and I will say this because Africa is my space of work, but I think those are important signals uh, to be sending out that Africa remains uh, a key issue or key factor in U.S. engagement with the rest of the world, and more importantly, that this particular issue will continue to feature. We are just going to wait and hope for the meat to be put on the bone so that we know exactly how we're building on some of the good work that has been done. So please join me in thanking our wonderful speakers uh, for a great uh, session. And I thank all of you for coming. Our next uh, program is going to be on the 16th of November on supply, supply chain challenges in Africa, again taking place under the Brown Capital Management Africa Forum. I'd like to ask our speakers to remain on the podium and the Brown team to please join us for a photo. And I'd like to invite the rest of you to join us for a mini reception, only about 15 to 20 minutes, where we can continue with the mix and mingle and the discussion. So thank you very much for coming.